got these two cans of contact cement and uh, let's see if I can get this uh, 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 oh no this is not going the way I I got to tell you, I didn't see that last one coming. <laughs> I didn't, like, I don't know, frustrated with the camera? Maybe that's what made her shank that. Uh, hey, welcome to Terra Nova. My name is Sean. How you guys doing? Doing good. Doing good. Uh, we're in the series, as Scott said, Mama Didn't Raise No Fool. And uh, we're in part four of the series. I just want to say this really quick. In two weeks, on Father's Day weekend, we're kicking off a brand new series called Road Trip on a Journey with Jesus. And I'm super excited about this series. It's going to be, we're going to be walking through a section of one of the biographies of Jesus' life uh, told by a historian named Luke. It's one of the documents that's found in the New Testament. And the way Luke tells this story of Jesus, very early into the story, Jesus announces that he is going to be killed in, in Jerusalem. And at that point in Luke's story, Jesus sets his face towards Jerusalem. And the rest of Luke's story, the way Luke crafts his story of Jesus' life, takes place on the road as Jesus is headed to Jerusalem, where as a reader and, and, and Jesus himself knows he's going to die. And on the road, he's teaching his disciples with that looming ahead in the distance. And uh, it's a profound way to tell the Jesus story. And we're going to be working through that through the entire summer. So this is like a summer series going over a handful of weeks. And uh, I hope you'll join us for it. I'm excited about it. A teaching series on the life and teachings of Jesus. And uh, so that's coming up in two weeks. But today we are in part four of this series, Mama Didn't Raise No Fool. The subtitle is Gaining Wisdom from the Proverbs and Your Mama. And uh, the Proverbs is this document in the Hebrew Scriptures found in what we call the Old Testament of the Bible, this document that's really all about something we said last week, human flourishing. And this might come as a news flash to you. News flash, God wants humans to flourish. He wants you to flourish. In fact, he wants everybody to live a life that's really, really flourishing. And so Proverbs is this collection, this book of Proverbs is this collection of hundreds and hundreds of these sayings, these wise, pithy, short, often two-line sayings about the principles of wisdom. The principles and the word we've been using is chokmah. That's the Hebrew word for wisdom. It's like the practical genius, the practical know-how of, of living life really, really, really well. This way of living life, of flourishing. And we've been pairing up some of this ancient wisdom from the Proverbs with these famous momisms, like these, these great things moms say, which I think is just kind of perfect because moms are known for great things they say because they don't want to raise no fools. But it's also perfect because wisdom in the book of Proverbs, as we discovered in week one of the series on Mother's Day, wisdom in the book of Proverbs is personified as a woman, which is always like, well, of course, what else would wisdom be personified as? And today, uh, we're going to talk about something that all moms have said. In fact, not just all moms, all parents have said probably multiple, multiple times. And it's this right here. And I would like us all to say it out loud together. Say this with me. Life's not fair. How many of you had parents that said that to you? How many have said that to your kids at some point? Life's not fair. Yeah, life's not fair. You can picture, your, you can picture the scene. Mom turns just in time to see little Johnny shove his brother, Joey, and Joey goes collapsing to the floor with a, with a dramatic show that would make an NBA player proud, realizing that mama just saw the waterworks begin, and mom tears into Johnny, who offers a legally sound defense, but he pushed me first. He, did, he started it. He pushed me first. I'm just getting even. 
This is just about justice. I am setting the moral universe in order. I'm doing the Lord's work here. Like, this is, this is justice, mom. And mom, is mom convinced? Is mom moved by the argument? No, not at all. She says, I don't care who pushed who first. Don't push your brother. To which Johnny responds with the existential angst of a thousand generations. But that's not that's not fair. That's not fair. That's not even. And life is supposed to be fair. Things must be fair and even. So today, I want to talk about one surprising counterintuitive thing that you can do to ruin every relationship in your life. Seriously, all you have to do to ruin every relationship in your life is play fair. Just play fair. Just be fair. Good for good and bad for bad, nice for nice, and not so nice for not so nice, favors for favors, snubs for snubs. She just didn't even say hi to me. Well, I'll show her. Love for love, anger for anger, just be fair, just play fair. You treat me well, oh man, you treat me well. Oh, I am, I am the best friend you'll ever have. I am so kind and generous and caring. You do me dirty, mm. you hurt me, you snub me, you talk that way to me and I will give it back to you. You fulfill everything you said, you show up, you do it just the way we talked about. I'm grateful, I'm responsible, I'll show up for you, I'll do well for you. You drop the ball, you fail me <clears throat> more than once. Oh, no, 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 see, fool me once, shame on me, or you. Fool me twice, shame on me. Uh, I don't get fooled twice. I, you know what, if you're not gonna show up here, I'm just gonna put your project, I'm gonna put your needs on the bottom of my to-do list. That's fair. That's fair, right? That's even, that's justice. And it will ruin every relationship in your life. It will ruin your work relationships. It will ruin your business relationships. It will ruin family relationships. It will ruin your love life, your romantic relationships. It will ruin friendships. It will ruin your neighbor's relationships. It will ruin every relationship in your life because fair, see, fair is doing good to others as long as they do good to us. That's fair. And by the way, I think that's most people. In fact, it might mo be most people in this room. Most people are good people. They are fair people. They are nice people. They're nice as long as other people are treating them nicely. They are nice. And when they get burned or they get hurt or snubbed or treated poorly, they respond fairly. They do the fair thing one way or the other, one way or the other, now or later, actively or passively, hot war or cold war, one way or the other, in some form or another, they give it back. They give it back. So like, well, now you can see like, oh, that's the way it's going to be. Well, then that's the way it's going to be. And now you can see exactly how it feels. But the problem with playing fair, at least one of the many problems with playing fair is this. When I'm playing fair, it's like I need the other person to be good in order for me to be good. I need the other person in the relationship to be healthy and fully functioning and mature in order for me to be healthy and fully functioning and mature. And if you're not being healthy and fully functioning and mature, well, then I'm just going to give you what you're giving me because I need you. I, see, I need you to play at this level in order for me to play at this level. And the problem with that is no one's perfect. No one, no one is going to give us an unending flow of highly functioning, totally emotionally mature, very healthy, loving, good responses. And so it's just inevitable. It's just going to happen. One person in the relationship gets withdrawn and detached. The other one feels abandoned and gives them the silent treatment. It's just going to happen. One person is kind of sarcastic or snarky, snarky. Well, the other person is just sarcastic right back. One person gets angry and all worked up. The other person snaps right back at them. One person drops the ball that they were going to do. So the other person, well, I'll just drop their ball. I'll just drop their ball. He started it. That's, that, then they'll know how it feels, right? If that's the way it's going to be, well, then that's the way it's going to be. And that, I think, really is the mentality of the masses. I think, that's, I think that's most people, possibly even most people in the room, like good and fair and nice people. But here's the thing. Good, fair, nice people get divorced every day. And some of you have seen couples that got divorced and you were so surprised because it's like, but they're both such good people. Yeah, of course. Good, fair, nice people, they get divorced every day. Good, fair, nice business partners split up every day. Good, fair, nice 
family members get estranged from one another every day because fair is good, but fair is not good enough. Fair is good, but fair is not good enough for real life. It's not good enough for real life because fair is only good as long as everybody else is being good. Fair only shows up as long as everybody else is showing up. And life's not fair. Life is not fair. And that's why wise people know better. Wise people know, wise people know life's not fair, so don't play fair. Play better than fair. Life's not fair, so don't play fair. Play better than that. See, fairness, fairness is, fairness is I give back as good as I am given. Fairness is you just give back as good as you're given. You just show up and you be fair. But wisdom says, oh, no, 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 no. That is not the way to flourish in life. Wisdom says give back better than. Give back better than you are ever given. When faced with other people's worst, then you be at your best. That's when it turns on for you. Like become the kind of person who redeems and transforms and elevates the other in the relationship. Become the kind of person who redeems and transforms and elevates the moment rather than sinking down into the moment. And don't you know, like those are the kind of relationships I want to have. I mean, I want to be surrounded by people who do that. Don't you? I mean, seriously, when I'm not at my best or when I'm actually even at my worst, they're bringing me up not giving it back to me. I need people like that in my life. I want to be surrounded by people like that in my life. And I bet you want to be surrounded like that too. Now, before we go on, I just need to give you a warning. The warning is this. We are crossing over to advanced level wisdom here. Like this is, this is like ninja level wisdom, okay? It's the kind of wisdom, think about this, where my maturity and my health on any given day, the health of my behaviors and the health of my reactions and responses is not dependent on the health of, and maturity of the person in front of me. I don't need you to be healthy and mature in order for me to be healthy and mature in the relationship. And this is, this is next level stuff, okay? This is advanced level wisdom. Now, here's the Hokma principle from the book of Proverbs. It goes like this. If your enemy, okay, if your enemy is hungry, well, you give him some food to eat. If your enemy is thirsty, give him some water to drink. Help him out. Now, you got to know, the ancient world, when this proverb was given, the ancient world was brutal, brutal when it comes to revenge and retaliation. In most cultures in the ancient world, including some cultures still today, revenge and retaliation is actually a core value. It's like a cultural virtue. When someone does something that shames you or dishonors you or humiliates you, the way, the way to regain your honor is to get that, to do that back. And the more cleverly, the less they see it coming, oh, the sweeter it is. And so ancient laws like eye for eye, tooth for tooth, those were actually laws of what's called limited retribution, limiting retribution, like to curb excessive, excessive retaliation because excessive retaliation was so common that we needed to limit it to just what you had been, what had been done to you. But this goes to a whole nother level, doesn't it? This goes to another whole level. When your enemy's weakness, here's what this proverb is saying. When your enemy's weakness shows up and provides you an opportunity, like, oh, goody, 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 goody. Like you were so this way and you were so that way, but now you need something. Now you have a weakness. When your enemy's weakness provides you with an opportunity, help them. Help them sincerely. Give them what they need. Your difficult coworker needs some help getting that project across the line. Help them get it across the line. Do that for them. Your difficult neighbor is in the hospital. Bring their family a meal. You do something that's the other extreme. You go to the complete other direction. Don't be fair. Don't be fair. Be better than fair. Be better than, be shockingly, redemptively good. And when you do that, here's what the proverb says will happen. In doing this, you will heap burning coals on his head and the Lord will reward you. It's like, okay, the the last part's nice, but can we go back to the part just before that? Like the heaping burning coals part, like what? I mean, that sounds kind of fun, honestly, but it also seems to go a little against this principle of showing up and really good. And you know, what is that about? Well, scholars and historians are actually a little divided about what this is a reference to. It may be alluding to an ancient 
uh, Egyptian practice of penitence, where when someone had done something wrong in the village or in the community and wanted to demonstrate their remorse for that or how sorry they were, their regret, they would carry a pan of coals on their head. It was like, ah, was it actually a thing? And so possibly this becomes an, a, 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 a metaphor, if you will, for just feeling ashamed of yourself and wanting everybody to know how sorry you are. In other words, it might be saying when you do good, to people who've harmed you or done wrong to you, it kind of it kind of exposes their attitude and their behavior for what it for what it is. It kind of confronts them a little bit with their shame. Now, whether or not this particular proverb is talking about that Egyptian practice, it does seem to reflect this uh, that that whole idea. And this is so powerful. This is so powerful. Here's the advanced level stuff, my friends. We all tell ourselves a story to justify our way of being in the world. We are all every day a running self-justifying narrative in our minds all the time, every day, to justify our way of being in relationship, our way of being at work, our way of being in, at, at like our way of reacting. We are all telling ourselves a story that makes sense of what we're doing and how we're acting. We are all doing that all day long. And, and when I treat you poorly, or I'm, like, I'm a bit of a jerk, I'm not my best self, and you respond in kind, you just give it right back to me, I feel totally justified in having treated you the way I treated you. Like, see, I was right to be that way towards you because look at you right now. You're just confirming everything I thought, and I am right to continue to treat you that way. I was right because you just showed me I was right, but when, you, when I treat you poorly, and you respond with goodness and thoughtfulness and nobility and generosity, especially in my weakness, especially in my need, I'm left without real, uh, my justification is gone. You starve my story, right? And I either need a new reason to treat you badly and to continue to see you deserving that, or I might actually have to come face to face that I might be a little bit of a jerk like I might be, have been in the wrong for having, has that ever happened to you? Uh, it's happened to me multiple times. Like I'm being less than great. I'm being, I'm being kind of snippy and snotty and snarky. And someone else is just marvelous in that moment. And I feel kind of yucky. It's like, ooh, I was a bit of a, I was kind of a, I think I was a jerk there. I feel badly about it. That, my friends, is genius. That is hokmah. Now, this principle of flipping the script is actually picked up a thousand years later in a letter written by a man named Paul or the Apostle Paul, St. Paul. The letter is known as the letter to the Romans. It's in the documents that we refer to as the New Testament. And this statement that we're going to look at today actually comes from the end of that letter. And he's talking about difficult relationships, which is something he knew a whole lot about. And it comes at the very end of this longer letter known as the letter to the Romans, where he's been, he's been describing or defining what God has done to restore and redeem fallen humanity, Adam's fallen race, to restore us all to a new humanity, to the people we are created to be, that when we begin to follow Jesus, our old self, our old broken self dies, and we are resurrected to this new life, this new creation. And so he's been using this language. And at the end of his letter, he says, now here's what that actually means for you. This is what that means on the ground level. Here's the the how this plays out. Here's how to be a Christian. And that's where the letter changes in Romans chapter 12. And we're jumping into the middle of this section. He starts this little part out by saying, do not repay anyone evil for evil. Do not repay. Do not play fair. Do not repay anyone evil for evil. And I find it interesting that he goes all the way to this word evil. I find that interesting because it's like Paul is saying, hey, I'm not trying to water it down. I'm not trying to put a positive spin on, well, maybe she didn't mean it. And maybe you just need to see it from his perspective. And maybe it really wasn't all that bad. You know how we say to other people when they're really worked up, like maybe he's not trying to talk us out of it. He just goes straight for Maybe it was that bad. Maybe she did mean it. Maybe it was absolutely evil. But your approach in life as a follower of Jesus is never tit for tat. It's never eye for eye. You did unto me, so now you're going to see what it feels like. You're not fair. As a follower of Jesus, you're not fair, so don't play fair. Play better than fair. Instead, he says, give careful thought. Give careful thought. Let's throw that up there. Next slide. 
There it is. Give careful thought to doing what is good in the sight of everyone. Now that phrase, careful thought, give careful thought, is actually a translation of one single Greek word. Paul's writing this letter in Greek and we translate it into English. And the Greek word he uses is prono, uh, uh, pro, pronaumenoi, which is the simple form of it is pronoeo. And it literally means pro is pre, noeo is think. It literally means to think before. Like, Put, put some thought into this beforehand. You got, you got to prepare yourself beforehand. Prepare for it. Sketch it out. Think about it. Get ready. Be prepared in advance to do what is good and amazing and noble. Be ready for that. And then he adds this public element to it. In the sight of everyone. In other words, you develop the reputation because everybody sees that this is what you do. You develop a reputation of being the person who always does the right thing who always does the noble thing, even when other people are melting down, you show up, not because you're a doormat, but because you're so incredibly strong. And then he says, if it possible, live at peace with everyone. Live at peace with everyone. Now, for Paul, this author, peace is more than just... Um, the absence of war or the absence of conflict. Paul is trained as a Jewish rabbi and he is steeped in the Hebrew scripture and the Hebrew concept of peace or shalom, if you will, that's their word for it, is much bigger than its well-being, its wholeness, its everything being the way it's supposed to be. And it is fundamentally a relational concept. It's like interpersonal well-being, inner well-being, you are whole. And he's like, you live in wholeness, in peace with Everyone, that is like your base posture going through your life all day long, every way. To which I think most of it, would, most of us would say, everyone, like really, everyone. I mean, sometimes Paul just sounds so naive, doesn't he? Like, do you have any idea? I mean, seriously, where do you get? Do you have any idea what I have to put up with? Do you have any idea where I live? who I live with? Do you have any idea the people I have to work with and work for? Are you serious right now? Paul, you sometimes sound so incredibly naive, but Paul is not naive. Paul has a lot of difficult relationships. He has people wanting to kill him. How are you doing today? It's like, no, he knows what he's talking about. And that's why I think part of the reason why he says, if it's possible, if it's possible, live at peace with everyone, because how many of you know, it's not always possible. It's not always possible because not everyone wants to live at peace with you. As wonderful as you are, as amazing, think of that. Who wouldn't want to and not everybody does? But here's the catch. We are all really good at telling ourselves a story. We are really good at telling ourselves a story that we want to hear that makes all of the sense in the world about our way of being in the relationship that rationalizes everything we do. And after all, they started it in our circumstances. I mean, if you understood, you would know it is not possible to live at peace in this situation. And so here's what Paul attaches the if to. This is so important. He attaches the if to this clause in the middle, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. In fact, I would love us to say this out loud, only personalize it and say, as far as it depends on me and turn the you into me and say this out loud just to hear ourselves saying it. So I want you to say it out loud. Let's say it together. If it is possible... As far as it depends on, live at peace with everyone. In other words, this is not about them. This isn't about, this isn't about them and what they won't do. This isn't about my dad and what he's always done and you know, he repeatedly does. This isn't about my sister-in-law and her perfect little life and everything goes well. And then she walks into my house and then she always looking down. This isn't about my lame boss or my 15-year-old. It's not about them and what they do or don't do and won't apologize for and won't change. This isn't about them. This is about who? Me. This is about me and what I can do and how far, how far I'm willing to go. In other words, the onus for peace, the responsibility for peace is always on the follower of Jesus. The responsibility, the onus for peace is always on you as a follower of Jesus to be the mature, the healthy, the wise one, even when no one else is. And then he, he restates the first thing he said in a slightly different way. He says, do not take revenge, my dear friends. Don't take, re don't, don't seek to hurt or punish or get back at others just because of what they said or how they're being. Don't get even. Do not play 
fair. And by the way, this includes all of the little subtle things we do to dish it back, right? Because you know this, there are hot wars and there are cold wars, right? There are hot wars of aggressive words and insults and slams and digs and screaming matches and throwing things and scathing emails and mic drop moments like zingers, like bam, I just got you and now I'm walking. There are hot wars. And then there are the cold wars, the cold wars of emotional withdrawal and silent treatments and cold shoulders and short answers that have a little bite to them. You know, the passive aggressive banging around of things. Where are my passive aggressive people at? Where are you at? You know, don't raise your hand. I, it's, it's, and when you're good at it, and I hope you're good at it, like you got to be good at it because if you're good at it, everything is so nuanced to maintain plausible deniability. You know what I mean by that? Plausible deniability goes like this. Who's angry? What are you talking about? All I said was, all I said was, all I meant was, I did, everything's fine. Oh, no, no, no. That's, you're, you're, you're putting that on me. No, it's all, but I'm at war. Oh, I'm at war and you need to know it, but I will not acknowledge it. I want you to know what it feels like. It's only fair. And by the way, you started it. Don't do that. No, do not take revenge, even the subtle, passive aggressive forms of revenge. And then he says something that's truly surprising, but leave room for God's wrath for it is written, it is mine to avenge. I will repay, says the Lord. It's like, now we're talking. Let's talk about God's wrath for a minute. Like, is that in the Bible? Are you kidding me? Finally, there's something in the Bible I can really get excited about. Like, go get them, God, seriously. And may I offer a few suggestions? I suddenly want to pray. I want to have a little moment here. Leave room for God's wrath? Like, what's that about? Now, this is really important. Justice is actually a good thing. And your desire for justice is a good thing. There's nothing wrong with desiring it. There's a frustration that you may have been feeling this whole message. Like, this is the worst message in the world. Like, what? So you're saying they should just get away with it. You're just saying, like, no repayment. They just do whatever they want to do. And then I'm all nice and perfect. So they don't even know what it feels like. That doesn't even feel, that does not feel fair. That does not feel just. Justice is actually a really good thing. But here's the catch. We are at best imperfect arbiters of justice, and at worst, and usually it is worse, constant escalators of more pain and injustice. I'll say that again. In our best moments, we are imperfect arbiters of justice. That's why justice is so rare. That's why everything we see is like, that's, that's just not the way. We are imperfect arbiters of justice at our best, but at our worst, we are constant escalators of more pain and more injustice. And part of the problem with retribution, part of the problem with re retaliation, part of the problem with my desire to get even and for things to be fair is this. The pain that I experience always seems worse than the pain that I inflict on the other person. Isn't that true? Like the pain that I feel is so much greater than the pain that I cause. And there's all kinds of research around this one. Uh, there's a study I read about a few years back where they took a group of subjects and they paired them up into twos and people sitting across the table would receive pressure. The, the, the other would apply it through a machine by way of a machine that was calibrated and measured so the, the people couldn't see the, the pounds of pressure, but the machine knew it, right? And so there's a certain amount of pressure that's applied to one person's finger, and then they're given the instructions to exert the same amount of pain, like the same amount of pressure on the other person's finger, an equal amount. But when it came turn, to, uh, their turn to inflict the pain, they always inflicted more. They always inflicted more pain, more pressure than they had received, always. Always, always, always. It was always tit for tat and a little bit more. It was always eye for eye plus a little something extra. It's the story of little Johnny and his brother Joey. You push me, I shove you. It's always just a little bit more because the pain I feel always seems greater than the pain I cause. And we are at best imperfect arbiters of justice at worst. And, and life is usually more towards this end. We are just constant escalators of adding a little bit more and a little bit more and a little bit more. There is only one. There is only one who knows who knows enough, who knows exactly what happened, 
not the stories, not the self-justifying narratives, not just my perception of how it went and your perception of how it went. There's only one who actually knows exactly what happened, who has all of the context and all of the empathy and all of the wisdom and all of the courage and all of the justice to perform the role of avenger and to do it consistently and well and redemptively. And God is saying, let me do my job. Trust me, trust me, trust me. Let me do my job with them. Give them to me, give them to me. Leave room for me to work because revenge is above your pay grade and outside your wheelhouse. You don't know how to do it well and it's not even what you're supposed to be doing. Let me do my job. And so, so rather than repaying them, I release them to God. Rather than repaying them, I release them to God. I have this desire, this need for things to be fair and just and for repayment. But the longer I hold on to that need, man, it seeps like poison into my soul. Listen, carrying revenge around is like carrying radioactive material. A few seconds into it, it is already killing you. It's killing your soul. And so I say, God, I can't carry this anymore. I can't carry this grievance. I can't carry this, this evil. I can't ca- I'm going to release them to you. I, God, I'm taking them off my hook and I'm putting them on your hook. I'm gonna take them off my hook, I'm gonna put them on your hook. God, you take this case over. You take this case over, you deal with them as you see best. I'm releasing this person to you right now. And by the way, that's what forgiveness is. I'm taking them off my hook, I'm putting them on God's hook. It is now his case, not mine, which raises a question. Like, okay, so if I'm not repaying them, and I'm not playing fair, and I'm not returning, like dishing it back like I've received it, and I've got this really difficult situation in my life, I've got these difficult people I have to live with, so then what do I actually do? And here's where Paul quotes that Proverbs. That proverb, here's where the whole thing starts to flip. He says, on the contrary, on the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If they're thirsty, they need something, you do that for them. You do good for them. You do something redemptive. You do something generous, something transformative. In other words, you take the evil that you've been given and you flip it around and turn it upside down and you give it back to them as good. And in doing this, you will heap burning coals on his head. And then Paul brings it all together with this statement right here. So do not be overcome by evil. Do not Do not let evil win. Do not be overcome by evil, which, by the way, is exactly what's happening. When we need the other person to be healthy in order for us to be healthy. When we need the other person to be a fully functioning uh, human in order for we ourselves to be fully functioning at their best in order to be at our best so that when they're less than our best, we're a little bit less than our best too. We are being overcome by evil. We are being overcome by evil. And let me tell you, evil will always beat you. When you try to show up with evil, with more of your evil, like it will always beat you. Evil is a bully. It will steal your lunch money every single day day of the week. It will steal what is best about you. It will always win. You cannot beat evil by showing up with more evil, trying to match evil for evil. Evil will win. It will overcome you. And many of us have seen that play out all the time in our relationships. The only way, the only way to not let evil win is to overcome evil with the opposite, to actually do the opposite, to do good. And so, in other words, let's pull this all together. Uh, When someone hurts you, betrays you, is less than their best with you, don't play fair. Don't be fair. Be better than fair. Don't repay evil for evil. You start to think about, think about, give careful thought to, be prepared to do the good and noble, beautiful thing. And as much as it is possible for you, you live in peace with every single person. Do not take revenge. Do good to them. Take them off your hook and place them on your hook. And on the contrary, on the contrary, You look at ways that you can actually do something that is so surprising and so unexpected and so good that it begins to change the narrative. Now, I want to make this really practical for us for just a moment. Now here comes some application. Maybe there's a person that you've been thinking of during this series, or maybe it's a group of people, a whole number of people like, I don't know how this plays. Here's what I'd love to have you do. I've done this so many times in my life. If you're having a hard time with someone, 
and their name has come to mind while we've been talking, here's what I want you to do. I challenge you. I dare you. Think of something good to do for them. Totally unexpected. Something totally unexpected, but something truly, truly good. And then this afternoon or tomorrow morning, if it's at work, like you just do that for them. You do it for them and they don't even need to know that you did it. Most of the time I, I do this, I'm just like, I need to just stay anonymous with this because it probably has more to do with me than it does with them. I'm just gonna do something good and maybe they do need to see you re respond in a really generous, good way. But, but I, would, I would challenge you when faced with difficult relationships to think of prona umanoi, think of something really good that you can do for them, get prepared to do it and then execute in the next couple days before you write it off. And when you do that, here's what happens. When you respond to evil with good, you change the equation. You change the whole equation because we all know what evil plus evil turns into. We all know that, right? We don't hardly have to know the math to know what evil plus evil equals. It equals more evil, doesn't it? It always does. But now suddenly the equation is evil plus good. Evil plus good equals well, I don't know. Who knows, right? Who knows what evil plus good equals? It's confusing. It's disarming. It's unexpected. It's a little off balancing. And just possibly, just possibly it's redemptive and transforming and elevating. And just possibly it creates some room for God to do something that you are not able to do. Life's not fair. Life's not fair, so don't play fair. Don't th go through life trying to play fair. Play better than fair. Play better than fair because fair, let me tell you, fair is for, fair is for novices. Let's throw that next slide up. Looks like we're behind. Yep. Fair is, fair is for novices. Fair is for children. Wise people are like relationship jujitsu masters. Wise people are like relationship jujitsu jiu masters who take all of the negative momentum of the other person, all that negative juice, all that negative energy, they take it and they absorb it and they flip it around and they transform it and they give it back as something super helpful and surprising and leaves the other person off balance entirely. Wise people, wise people take it to a whole additional level. And the word for this, the word for this is grace. Grace. See, the law of retaliation says... I do harm to those who do harm to me. That's justice. That, by the way, is the, that's justice. Somebody does something bad, something bad happens to them, justice. The law, of the law of restraint takes a little bit farther and says, no, I'm not gonna do that. I'm not gonna do that. I'm not gonna get sucked into their game, tit for tat. I'm just gonna ignore it. I'm just gonna let it go. I'm gonna do nothing to the person who harms me. And that's mercy. But this is the law of reversal. This is the law of the relationship jujitsu master. This is the law of reversal that says, I actually do good to people who harm me. I'm at my best. I'm at my best with those who are not at their best with me. When others let me down, I bring them up. I show up in the way that they most need me to show up. And if you're not a follower of Jesus, if you're not a follower of Jesus, I just got to say, that's just a wiser way to live. It is the path to human flourishing. Try it, discover it. It is a healthier, better way to live. But if you call yourself a follower of Jesus, if you call yourself a Christian, there's another piece to this that takes it to another level. Because as Christians, as Christians, we all live in the shadow of a cross. We all live in the shadow of a cross where God himself took all of the hostility and betrayal and evil of humanity. And rather than repay it and play fair and give it back, he transformed it into love and grace and gave that back to us. That's grace. And that's why we thought maybe the best way to end today would be by remembering, remembering that, by celebrating something we often refer to as communion. Uh, and around the room, you'll see there are these tables set up, two in the front, one in the back corner there. And on those tables, there's some bread and some juice that represents this, this grace, this way that God took upon himself everything that was messed up that we have done to ourselves and each other and even to him. And he turns it around and brings back healing and wholeness and goodness and grace into our lives. And this bread and juice represents how God did that on the cross, this sacrifice, the sacrificial love of God himself. And as Christians, 
we live our lives in the shadow of that. That is not just our defining moment. That defines us as a movement and as individuals. And the beautiful thing about communion, what we're about to do is the band, they're gonna play a couple songs and whenever you feel ready and you feel like you're, you're ready to get up, just work your way over to the one of the tables and you can take the bread and dip it in the juice. And then here's what we do. We, we take that inside ourselves. And, and, and it's like we are metaphorically perhaps or maybe even more profoundly spiritually, we are taking inside ourselves the sacrificial love and grace of God and metabolizing that into the cells of our body. And as you do that today, as you walk up to that table, I wanna invite you to have a little brief conversation with God. Don't just do it as a, as a ritual or an act you do. Have a brief little conversation with God where you say this, God, thank you for not playing fair with me. Because if you had, mm, thank you for not playing fair. Thank you, thank you for taking all that we have done as human beings and turning it into something healing and loving and full of grace. I want, I want that inside me. Here's my prayer. Here's my prayer. Maybe this is yours too. I want that to metabolize into my cells like this bread and this juice. I want it to become so a part of me that grace is my way of life. And I pray that for myself and I pray it for you. And as we sing and as we spend some time reflecting, I invite you to pray that prayer yourself as you go up to the tables and receive communion.
Why don't you stand as we sing this together? And we won't forget how good you have been. We see it again at the table, at the table of the Lord. And we won't forget just how good you have been. We see it again at the table, at the table of the Lord. But we won't forget how good you have been. We see it again at the table. At the table of the Lord We won't forget How good you have been We see it again at the table Oh, they keep on 
following me Wherever you go, I know I will follow I will follow you Wherever you go, I know I will follow I will follow you I will follow you Wherever you go I know I will follow I will follow you Wherever you go I know I will follow I will follow you pray together. God, we do not want to forget or lose sight of just how good you are to us, of the way that you take all of the things that we do upon yourself, our sin, our dysfunction, the, the poor decisions that we've made, and you don't repay us for those things, but you release us from that. And then you invite us, you call us to do the same. And so as, as your community of followers, we want to collectively say yes to that. We want to ask you for the courage and the wisdom and the grace that we need to be your extensions in this world. And so would you fill us and you fill us with that desire and the ability and fill us with all we need to follow you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, hey, you can hang on your feet for just a moment. I want to thank you so much for being with us today. And I hope that, uh, that you just leave filled up with just this incredible wisdom of following the way of Jesus. Hey, on your way out, if you want to drop a couple things at the door, you're invited to that Connect card we mentioned a little bit earlier on. We'd love to get that from everybody. Uh, if you're part of the Terra Nova community and want to drop off one of these uh, offering envelopes, you can do that as well. And really anything you want to leave behind, our guest service members will take those from you. Um, but thank you so much for being with us today. And we hope to see you back next week for the finale of Mama Didn't Raise No Fool. Thanks so much, everybody. God bless. Have a great week.